sorry, Emma. Uh, yes, I'm here. Yes, um, we can get started if you like then. Okay. Well, um, thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. This, this is Emily at Quasi, and uh, today we're going to hear the second uh, informational webinar regarding the National Water Center Summer Institute for 2016. So today we are going to hear from the theme leaders of the Summer Institute. And um, David Mainman is going to introduce the webinar and, and the theme leaders. So David, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thank you so much, Emily. So um, I'm going to present this webinar jointly with uh, Sagi Cohen, Sarah Praskovitz, Ibrahim Demir, Alfonso Mahir, who are the theme leaders um, who are going to be participating from the academic community in the US. And we have a couple of people, John Nelson from the US Geological Survey and Albert Van Dyke from Albert, uh, Australian National University who are also going to be helping, but uh, they're not going to be on the call uh, in person. So let me just briefly introduce again uh, what is happening. Uh, there will be a national water model coming uh, operational in June of 2016. It'll be running on the, uh, for the continental United States at the NOAA Weather and Climate Operational Supercomputer System, which is called WCAS. And that will take high resolution rapid refresh forecasts and other weather forecasting, uh, convert those into uh, weather and precipitation data which support land atmosphere simulation. That land atmosphere simulation will be uh, translated into river flow forecasting uh, in the WERF hydro system which comes from NCAR. And then uh, that will produce stream flow forecasts and in the future the idea is that this will then be linked to flood inundation uh, mapping and impact, although that is not yet um, part of the National Water Model. And so a significant part of what we will be doing for the Summer Institute is in helping to build a basis for flood inundation mapping and impact in the future. Uh, now, what's happening is that the current flood forecasting system has 6,600 basins and 3,600 forecast points and has an average drainage area of uh, 400 square miles. And the new one that's going to become available in June will have one square mile uh, catchment areas. It'll be a national flow network. So for an area that you see here, the Blanco River at Wimberley, there'll be two forecast basins and one point, which is the current system becomes 130 catchments and flow lines that are uniquely labeled and forecast in the new system. So this is really a flow continuum model, a national stream network uh, from atmosphere to the oceans and from coast to coast. This is going to be an unprecedented thing uh, in our national life of hydrology. And so it's very exciting to be able to contribute to some themes of research uh, for the National Water Model. Uh, and we're going to talk about six of them, uh, flood inundation measurement, mapping, uh, densified measurement, data assimilation and forecast error, community case studies, flood emergency response, and the continental water balance. Let me introduce the leader for the Flood inundation and what map, flood inundation mapping theme, which is Sagi Cohen. Sagi, can you take over from here? Yes. Uh, all right. So I have we have a lot to cover in very little time. So I'll just well let's that's that. Um, so uh, David and I kind of were discussing about what this theme should look like, and you know, uh, inundation mapping is a lot of thing to a lot of different people, or a lot of different thing to a lot of people. So um, what we've done so far, or people have been doing uh, main, mainly using cross-sections to try to characterize the channel and the floodplains and see how we can use hydraulic models or other topography analysis to try to come up with a way to predict or to uh, estimate the flood inundation. Um, and it has a lot of advantages and a lot of good things that came out of it, but at a national scale, at the hyper-resolution that this framework is supposed to be, that's probably not going to be the best approach. Um, so we're thinking of, uh, let me, um, we're thinking of, of two main uh, complementary mapping techniques that we're going to use, and I'm going to finish this, my a bit, I guess, about, about this with the application of these techniques. Uh, so the first one is using satellite remote sensing data to uh, classify and therefore map uh, inundation. Um, and, and later, David will, I, I hope, pitch in and talk about his idea about river network-based topographic analysis. So I'm going to start talking about using satellite remote sensing data 
to map um, flood inundation. Uh, so we are actually very fortunate these days. In the last even a couple of years, the uh, availability of satellite remote sensing data has just exploded. Part of it is thanks to the actual agencies that do that, NASA, USGS, but also thanks to uh, things like Google Earth or Earth Engine that now make it so much more available to, to, to us, the, to everyone, basically. So uh, each uh, satellite platform has its advantages and disadvantages when it comes to mapping uh, inundated regions. Uh, so what I'm proposing to do, it's probably the best approach to do, is to use a, 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 a suite of these, so, so a combination of these. Uh, and I don't have a time, but those of you who know a little bit about satellites, uh, this will be pretty familiar. Some of them have higher resolution than others, but have longer uh, revisit uh, periods, which uh, some of them can penetrate, like SAR, can penetrate through clouds and see it during the night. So that's a huge advantage, but they may be harder to classify. Um, now, when it comes to flood mapping using satellite remote sensing, in my view, there are two main applications. And within each one of these applications, there's a whole bunch of research that can be done. And hopefully, uh, the participant in the Summer Institute will take some of it. The first one is, is trying to think about near real-time mapping. So you have a flood occurring somewhere, um, and you're trying to tell first responders, relief agency, the government, the public, whoever, where is a flood is occurring at the moment or very uh, just recently, and what roads are closed and so on. There's a couple of global scale applications that are already doing that at different capacities. Uh, the Dartmouth Flood Observatory, for example, which is I'm a, I'm a collaborator in it, uh, they use MODIS um, satellites, so it's good for large dams, and, and, and so they do global rivers. They don't do a lot in the U.S., although they do cover the U.S. The Copernicus Emergency Management Service, they use a whole suite of satellites, uh, but also they're very selective about which uh, natural disasters they cover. So if we can advance this for as part of the uh, flood prediction system, I think that will be a huge uh, asset to, to everyone and to the system itself. Now, the second application that I think of, or the second a tier of, of project can relate to uh, mapping uh, past floods. Um, so floods that occurred uh, 10, 20, maybe even 25 years ago, depending on the satellite data availability. And we are kind of fortunate there's a, a couple of data sets that um, include um, uh, historical information about the location, timing, and sometimes magnitude of historical floods. And you have a screen capture here of one of them at the University of Oklahoma. So we can use this data, uh, and we were thinking about focusing on Alabama, actually, and try to classify or map uh, past events. So these events can be used. Um, uh, and here's some example, by the way. These are two um, um, uh, figures that I, I, I took from a poster that was presented by uh, a group in the last summer institute, so uh, Bradford Bates and his colleagues, they actually started working on this, and we can definitely advance that in this summer institute. But um, anyway, I'm thinking that the application of this past flood mapping will be, first of all, if we want to uh, do a lot of work with uh, hydraulic modeling, and, and David's going to explain what he's proposing in a minute, we need some sort of validation data either for, uh, you know, whatever hydraulic modeling we're doing, it's very hard to validate just using FEMA uh, zone risk or zone, flood zones uh, or, or others. So having that as a real, actual observation of flood inundation will be a huge asset, I think, for this effort uh, with other team, uh, teams. Also, if we can uh, help disseminate these kind of maps using some web interface, web GIS, and if someone has experience and want to work on that, that, that will be great. Then we can disseminate that for other scientists, for first responders, for policymakers, and, and so on in a really easy uh, and interactive way. And this is uh, a screenshot from another project that took place uh, during the last Summer Institute where uh, Sean Carter started working on something like that. And it can definitely 
there's a lot of work to be done there to make it very uh, user-friendly. So with this, I'm going to pass this to David, and he's going to talk a little bit about his idea of uh, network-based uh, analysis. David? Thank you, Sagi. So what you see here is a real-time flood inundation map uh, that is developed by the National Weather Service and the U.S. Geological Survey. This happens to be for Onion Creek at Highway 183, just near Austin. And as the, um, the reference point there was the center of the reach, which is the stream gauge, and as the water rises and falls at that stream gauge, the water, it spreads out or it, uh, and it increases in, in depth. And I have got the data for all of these uh, maps. They're about a short distance, a couple of miles long around the stream gauges. And each one of them looks like this, that there is a flood extent map for each one foot of geodetic elevation. Uh, and there's also a grid that shows the depth of flooding at that elevation. And these are just indexed by elevation, so that you can say as the water surface elevation rises and falls, the water spreads out. Um, <coughs> we have developed an analysis technique that produces hydraulic parameters that are associated with these inundation profiles. So, if we know what the inundation profile looks like, we can calculate the surface area, the volume, and the length for each uh, reach that the flooding is being mapped over. And if we divide those by the length, we get the cross-sectional area, width to perimeter, and top width. And if we take the ratio of area to perimeter, we get hydraulic radius. And those are the parameters that we need for proper uh, hydraulic routing using the St. Venant equations uh, in stream networks. Uh, one of the things that can help to support that is bathymetric data that have been collected by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and these are bathymetric data that SAGI has obtained from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for the Mobile Alabama River system uh, in Alabama. So the bottom of that map is actually Mobile Bay, and you can see on the right-hand side actually the uh, a section of the Black Warrior River in Tuscaloosa, when the extremely detailed data that the Corps of Engineers collects for bathymetry uh, in, er in re areas that have navigable rivers. Uh, another thing that we've been working on here at the University of Texas is a model called SPRINT. Uh, this is the work of my colleague Ben Hodges and a researcher at IBM called Frank Liu. And what they have done is to take um, the concepts of very large-scale integrated design of computer chips where they solve 100 million equations uh, every night to check on the effects of design changes on the chip to electricity flow and see if they've made some inadvertent changes. And they've developed a code from that for dynamic wave routing. They've solved this in Venon equations, which solve for flow and water surface elevation. Um, and that is now an open source model in GitHub. Uh, what we have done is to take that uh, code and to apply it to Travis County, Texas, which is the county that I live in and the home of the University of Texas. And there's 540 uh, reaches and flow lines here in Travis County. And what we did was have the rain falling and then increasing in small increments and then steady for a time, and then increasing in small increments and steady for a time. And we can actually sort of flood out the county. and takes about two hour, 200 hours for the water to flow right through the county. And we've got the average value of Manning then here of 0.05, which is a pretty rough estimate, but nevertheless, it's a first cut. And what we've been able to do then is to compare the water height versus flow rate, or the rating curve, at all those reaches and this one shows the Onion Creek at Highway 183. And the USGS rating curve is the blue line, and the brown one is the one that comes from the Sprint model. So there's some discrepancies between them, but you can see that there is a reasonable uh, agreement um, as, as it is. Um, and as we move forward, uh, oops, I've had some technical difficulties here. Quite sure what happened. Hold on one second. It looks like the share pod just. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, it, so I, all I can see is that is people's names. Anymore. Yeah, that's what I see too here. Hold on one second. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we're back now with rating curves of Travis County. At least I can see that. Um, so, 
it turns out that there's a method that's been developed in river ecology called height above nearest drainage, or HAND. And so if we take the catchments and flow lines upon which the national water model operates and the digital elevation model, we can calculate for each cell in the landscape the difference in elevation between that cell and the cell in the stream to which it flows. And that's called the height above the nearest drainage. And if you think about Bernoulli's equation, you've got z plus y plus v squared over 2g, then the elevation, digital elevation model is like the z, and the height above nearest drainage is like the y. And from that, you can get an inundation map just by saying the depth of the stream is less than 15 feet or less than some uh, arbitrary elevation. Uh, we are planning, with the collaboration of the Cyber GIS Computing Facility of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, to make that study for the whole continental United States uh, during 2016. That will be for 5 million kilometers of stream reaches, or 2.7 million stream reaches over the continental US. And as a start on that, we have made a case study, or beginning a case study, I would say, of how to apply that method to Tuscaloosa County, Alabama. So here's the home county of the University of Alabama. The big river on the left-hand side is the Black Warrior River that I was showing you before. And uh, so what we would like to do is to uh, focus our energies, at least in part, on the area right around the National Water Center and get a good understanding of how inundation mapping can be done there. And I want now to introduce uh, Sarah Preskovitz, who is uh, Assistant Professor in the Geography Department of the University of Alabama. And she's going to be talking about related things concerned with densified measurement and mapping and so on in Alabama. Take it away, Sarah. Thanks, David. Um, so a lot of the material in this theme, I think, overlaps and complements the first theme of flood inundation mapping that Sigi and David already talked about. Um, so the basic idea behind this theme is that densified forecasting requires densified measurement. Uh, we can you know, do all the modeling we want, but unless we have actual data as input to models and also for model validation, we're not going to get good results. Uh, so this can be facilitated by uh, radar uh, sensors for water level and velocity that are now available um, at a reasonably affordable price, um, which we can install in a demonstration site uh, in Tuscaloosa County. Uh, so we don't yet have a detailed plan for how many of these sensors we'll have or where specifically we'll be installing them, uh, but they can be easily installed on bridges and other structures. And I have a meeting next week with uh, staff from our local USGS field office to talk about the planning for the, the installment of the, the sensors. Um, so the idea behind this is that we have the gold standard, which is the USGS stream gauges, of which there are about 8,000 uh, nationally, which of course measure stage and discharge. Um, and what we're trying to uh, eventually incorporate into the national water model is flood inundation modeling at the NHD reach scale with 2.7 million reaches nationally. So that's a ratio of one USGS stream gauge for 340 um, NHD plus reaches. So clearly there's a lot of intermediate scale um, in between where we have uh, data from the USGS and where we're actually going to be applying the models. So that's where these uh, radar-based water level and surface velocity gauges can help to sort of bridge that gap. Um, uh, and, you know, starting that work with this uh, densified measurement uh, site near Tuscaloosa. So this uh, work with densified measurements and modeling um, can also leverage some work that I'm currently doing as part of a project funded by UCAR under the National Water Center Partners uh, Program, uh, part of the COMET program. Uh, this is a uh, hydraulic model intercomparison project in southeastern Alabama in the Choctahatchee, Yellow, and Pea rivers. And uh, the idea behind this project is uh, this basin is home to a relatively dense network of um, gauges as part of Alabama's uh, only flood warning system. So we have a detailed set of observations that we can use to validate uh, two hydraulic models 
auto route, which is an Army Corps of Engineers uh, model that's designed for uh, areas for which detailed cross-section data are unavailable, so it actually extracts cross-sections from DEMs. And then uh, LISPLOT FP, which is a 2D um, hydrodynamic model that's used for operational flood forecasting in Europe. So the idea is uh, to see uh, what's the sort of trade-off we can make between data input requirements, computational efficiency, and accuracy of modeling results so that we can um, optimize uh, the level of modeling complexity that we would need if we were to do flood, in flood inundation modeling at a national scale. Um, so these are just examples of research questions related to this uh, densified measurement and modeling theme. So using this Tuscaloosa demonstration site as a case study, how can we incorporate flood inundation modeling into the national water model? How can we estimate hydraulic parameters needed for flood inundation modeling? Um, how do floods affect the geomorphic characteristics of river channels and floodplains? And how can these densified water level and velocity observations be used to improve uh, flood inundation modeling? So some specific examples of um, each of these questions. For incorporating flood inundation modeling, um, having this dense network of sites will, um, in the Tuscaloosa County region will allow us to do uh, really detailed reach scale hydraulic modeling of individual uh, reaches, which can then be verified uh, with observations. Um, we're obviously not going to have uh, such detailed uh, data available everywhere uh, because we don't have detailed topographic and uh, bathymetric data for most rivers in the US. So if we want to do this sort of modeling at a national scale, we're, need to, we're going to need to figure out techniques for estimating hydraulic parameters from existing geospatial data sets, remote sensing data sets, and the Tuscaloosa demonstration site will be useful for this because it can get us a sense of how much data we actually need in order to do uh, good modeling. And uh, in addition, uh, the relationship between flooding and uh, hydraulics is not one way. Uh, the floods themselves uh, create geomorphic changes, channels adjust uh, to flood events. Uh, so getting a sense of um, how floods themselves change river channels and therefore influence uh, future flood events, I think, is another uh, potential area of research using uh, geomorphic modeling. And then finally, I think uh, the sort of overall question is how can we use these densified observations to improve hydraulic modeling? I think just like uh, the availability of high-resolution topographic data with LIDAR has really transformed the study of Earth's surface processes, having um, densified uh, hyd hydrology and hydraulic measurements can do the same thing for our study of, of rivers and flooding. And I think David's going to take over now uh, by talking about uh, some of Jonathan Nelson's models. Much, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. So uh, one of the collaborations that we are going to introduce to the 2016 Summer Institute is with Jonathan Nelson, who's with the USGS uh, in Golden, Colorado. And he's developed a project called IRIC, which deals with modeling of rivers. And so he and his colleagues, uh, they deal with sediment transport and local scale hydraulics in the manner that Sarah was describing. And they've developed a number of uh, numerical codes for two and three dimensional simulation of hydraulics and rivers. And in particular, we're going to work with two models called FastMac 2D, 2D and NACEFLOOD. FastMac is a steady state model and NACEFLOOD is an unsteady state model. And Jonathan is going to come to the Summer Institute and help to teach how these models can be used. So uh, this will be a sort of a training exercise for numerical hydraulics. And one of the things that Jonathan and his team are working on is the concept of uh, sort of reverse modeling of rivers. So, so they're asking the question, can we measure river bathymetry using remote sensing? Uh, can we use our understanding of computational flow and morphodynamics modeling to improve remotely sensed estimates of bathymetry? And can we generalize this hybrid method to include velocity? And so the USGS has an uh, experimental uh, setup called EEARL. It's Earth Observation something. And they're measuring from aircraft the uh, bottom of the rivers and also the surface velocity and flow. And there's 
different uh, reflections from the measurements that they're making. And these are some data which they have inferred from the aircraft measurements. So the left side is uh, points made by ground surveying, and the right side are elevations that are determined by remote sensing. So what the USGS people are doing is to try to understand how, using aircraft measurements, we can actually look at river flows as sort of a volumetric thing and be able to understand the fluid dynamics and uh, um, the bathymetry associated with them. And in doing that, they are saying, if we think about the conservation of momentum, we normally take bed elevation, discharge, roughness, and we solve for the velocity and water surface elevation. And notice that the measurements that Sarah was talking about of velocity and water surface elevation are what we would like to introduce into the Tuscaloosa uh, demonstration area. But the inverse method uses velocity and water surface elevation in an attempt to predict depth, and it requires highly um, accurate information and local information. So these are new innovative ways of thinking about the motion of river hydraulics. I want to turn now to our next speaker, uh, Ibrahim Demir from the University of Iowa, who's going to talk about data assimilation and forecast error. Go ahead, Ibrahim. Hey, hi. So, yeah, I mean, as Sarah said, uh, we have lots of similarities and also sharing lots of research questions between different teams. And here in this team, uh, our goal is to actually... Ibrahim, you, you sound a little faint to me. I don't know if it's uh, if anyone else can hear you, but can you speak a little louder maybe or speak into the phone? Yeah. How about now? Is it better? That's better. Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, our goal with this team is to study the effects of densified stream monitoring networks, similar to what uh, Sarah talked about, but for the ensemble model forecast for the stream, stream uh, flow prediction. And the National Water Center is utilizing the Wharf Hydro Modeling Framework to implement the new stream flow prediction uh, products at the resolution of NHT Plus coverage, which is actually over 2 million reach in the U.S. And it's going to be operational, uh, hopefully, this first half of the 2016. And the products from these model configurations will provide lots of different model outputs, which includes continental scale analysis and forecast for the hydrological variables. And here in the next slide, we'll see, actually, this is the slide that we shared from the previous presentation and also today, and this is from the David, that the, the, with the Wolf Hydro model, we would like to ingest the data from densified a dense network from the state of Iowa, where the Iowa Flood Center deployed over 250 additional sensors as a complement to the USGS uh, stream gauge locations, and in almost doubled the number of monitoring stations in Iowa, around 500 locations that we can get the real-time uh, stage values. And here in the next slide, you'll see the location of the Iowa Flood Center gauges which will be over 250 by this summer, and complementing the, the, another 250 uh, from the USGS, and covering a, uh, providing a very dense uh, streaming uh, stream flow network. And some of the research questions that we can explore by this team is how, how can we determine the forecast errors, how much can it be reduced through the densified measurements from the, the stream flow network, and how can we use this uh, data simulation and adjust the forecast to the obs uh, observations? And then effect of the placement and the number of sensors in a uh, watershed, how it affects the, the forecast error, and then how the effect of the different inputs from the rainfall or the hydrological parameters uh, will affect the forecast. So in the next couple of slides, I'll show you some examples from uh, different uh, various models that uh, shows multiple uh, forecast products or the, the results. And this is an example from, uh, that shows almost over uh, 50 uh, forecasts for the same location uh, and, and produced by either the different lead times, different inputs, biological inputs, or different uh, input data from the streams or the, the rainfall. And in the next example, you can see uh, actually a study from Iowa where we have a watershed with uh, six stream sensors, and you can see the results, you compare them together in a system like this, and it can be also compared with the observations and with uh, the colorful uh, representation on a map environment uh, where you can see 
the overestimation and underestimation of the stream flow uh, by the model running in Iowa. And similarly here, we can compare the, the forecast from uh, the same model, but by using different uh, rainfall products, like in this example, we have a stage four and CMORF utilized for the, uh, in the model, forecast model, and you can see the difference in different colors uh, on a map environment. And it could be also implemented in a real-time modeling system, like the national, uh, the World Hydro National Flood Model, and it, it allows us to understand the models better and also improve the forecast. And by building this uh, team, we could understand uh, the performance of a densified stream network on the, uh, the flood, uh, flood forecasting models and build a, maybe a case to utilize this low cost or affordable stream sensors to, to supplement the, the sensors we have from USGS and other sources. Thank you. In the next uh, so team, now, go, yeah. go ahead. Okay, so in the next team, uh, we have the community case study. It will be presented by Alfonso Mejia from the Penn State University. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, my name is Alfonso Mejia. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Penn State, and I'm leading the community case studies team. Um, <clears throat> so really, the, the main objective with this team is uh, basically to implement some of the outputs from the national water model to examine flooding in a specific communities. No? Um, <clears throat> To, to meet this and, and, and what we, we hope that what we learn from this community and specific implementations can, can help to inform the continental scale efforts. Um, so to meet this objective, we identified four uh, proposed uh, projects. Uh, the first project is, is the consists of very fine a stream for forecast from the national water model for selected city river systems across the U.S. Um, so basically the goal here is to use the output uh, from the national water model for selected locations, locations that uh, where we have forecast points adjacent to, to cities, large cities, and we can use those forecast locations to verify the outputs um, from, the, uh, from the national water model. And by verifying, I mean, you know, assessing the, the error, the skill, the reliability of those, of those initial forecasts. Mm -hmm. For the second project, we want to uh, evaluate flood modeling and mapping uh, uh, to implement an approach uh, within the National Water Model Framework in uh, Philadelphia. So the way I'm, I'm considering this for now is that we would take outputs from the National Water Model as boundary conditions to a hydraulic model. It could be the speed model, uh, some of the models, the ones that have been mentioned already, and, and similar, we could use some of the mapping approaches that have been mentioned. Uh, but we will force this hydraulic model with the outputs from the national water model, uh, and then we will look at, uh, and we will, do, we will do this in the Delaware, Delaware River next to Philadelphia. You know? We will look this way at, at flooding in Philadelphia. You know? uh, the third project is we're suggesting is to evaluate uh, ensemble forecasting with the national water model, again, possibly with application in the Delaware River so that we can use those outputs to feed the project two, the, the case study in Philadelphia. Um, and with Project 3, really what, the, what we are envisioning here is that we could uh, uh, use precipitation ensembles to force the national water model, and that way we can generate some estimates of uh, a stream flow forecast uncertainty. Uh, and, and not only the delta estimate uncertainty, but the idea is to, to see if, um, uh, which, which has been shown already, right, that using ensembles, can, you, gain, you can gain skills by using the ensembles uh, forecast. No? And the last project is, is the idea there is to look at flash flooding within Philadelphia. Um, this is, it, it could be linked to the river in flooding, but not necessarily. We would use DEM. Ideally, we would use the DEM and infrastructure data uh, to look at uh, causes and, uh, and flash flood potential within, within Philly. And then we would try to use that information to, to suggest make some recommendations about how to incorporate urban flash flooding in the national water model. Um, 
So part of the focus is in Philadelphia. Well, the reason is because flooding is a, is a big issue in Philadelphia. If you look at the, one of the USGS gauges, the one that is just upstream of Philadelphia, it has about 90 years of data. If you look at the data, you will find that out of the 10 largest flood events, the, 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 uh, five of those 10 have occurred in the last uh, 10 years. Um, so it is a big concern, and, and we will, of course, work with some of the stakeholders in Philadelphia to, to uh, help us identify flooding and, and relevant scenarios. Uh, we, we have already gathered some of the data for the hydraulic modeling. That's project two. Uh, this has been done by one of my uh, grad students. And we have the bathymetry, the one meter DM that we blended and we, we generated at a, a, <clears throat> a sort of an interpolated surface that we can now uh, use with the, the hydraulic model. And we will plan to use this data in the uh, summary institute. Um, and the next three slides that I have, I'm going to go briefly in the service of time to these three slides, but I'm just going to show some of the tools that we're using in my group that we think uh, that, that, that could help with implementing the projects that I'm suggesting. So one of these tools is the processor for stream flow, the stream flow ensemble. So this processor basically analyzes the stream flow forecast and allows you to estimate uncertainties on this forecast. Uh, another tool that we can use is uh, basically similar in spirit to the previous two, but this one analyzes the uncertainty in the precipitation ensembles. Uh, again, this is something that we can use in the Summary Institute. And the last two, uh, and these two could be used for project uh, two and three, for instance. Uh, the last tool is the, well, the ensemble verification system. This was developed by Brown et al. And it's something that we use basically to provide a consistent way of uh, looking at verification of precipitation and stream flow forecast. And it's, again, something that we can use with all of our projects. Uh, and this is, uh, OK. OK, so thank you very much. I'm going to take over now and talk about the uh, last two themes. Uh, appreciate that, uh, Alfonso. So the next theme is flood emergency response. and the question that we're trying to answer is how does the first response community actually benefit from all this information that we're generating from the science that you've just been hearing? And this is a community flood response map book that we've been working on with the city of Austin that shows detailed flood mapping for sections uh, of our city uh, from one road to the next road according to minor, moderate and major flooding. And this is a strategic overview map that is being developed for a section of the city. This is called Onion Creek, uh, the one that I showed earlier. This is at the level that the city manager or the chief of staff of the fire department would use for deploying uh, rescue resources when this area uh, is flooded. And it has been flooded twice in the last two years. Uh, this is a detailed pre-planning flood map that is developed ahead of time. They call it the uh, blue skies conditions so that the firefighters and police and other emergency response personnel can understand at particular locations for different water service elevations, how many people are going to be flooded, to what depth, who is going to have to be rescued, how, what roads are going to be underwater, and to what degree. Uh, so this is kind of like a, a planning level study. This is being done with the collaboration of uh, Harry Evans, who was Chief of Staff of the Austin Fire Department. And Harry and I have been working together to understand how we can um, link the flood forecasting system with emergency response, as you see here. Uh, we've done a preliminary uh, flood uh, mapping exercise for Tuscaloosa County, as Sagi mentioned, and we'd like to work with the first response community in Tuscaloosa County to do a similar thing for some reaches in the, in the Tuscaloosa County, like what I just showed uh, for Travis County here in Texas. Our final theme deals with, uh, with continental water balance. And the leader of this is Albert Van Dyke. He's from Australian National University. Uh, he couldn't be uh, here to speak in person, but he's made a YouTube video, which if you follow the um, address which is given here at the bottom of the slide, uh, you can see Albert uh, giving this particular presentation. And why this? Because uh, in Australia, they've done a lot of work on Australian water resource information systems. And one of the things they've been studying is to what degree does river flow respond when rain happens. And it depends a lot on whether you have the wet condition that you see on the left-hand side of this picture or the dry condition that you see on the right. And if rain falls on the left side, you get lots of runoff. And if rain falls on the right side, you get much less. So the question is, how can a continental water model inform that kind of uh, in insight? 
what we are doing with our national water model has soil water modeling under a model that's called NOAA MP that is within the WEF Hydro uh, framework uh, for hydrologic forecasting. And so the idea is that we would run or we would use the result of the national water model, which will include all these soil moisture parameters and other aspects of the catchment water balance. And in Australia, the equivalent model is called RL, which uh, Dr. Van Dyke was instrumental in developing. And so in both countries, the idea is to have a common operating picture of catchment conditions across the continent that could be used for flood uh, forecasting and preparedness. And this is a picture which Albert prepared um, of the, one of the Prime Ministers of, uh, of Australia, together with the Chief of their Intelligence Services, uh, looking at a common operating picture of military operations. So a common operating picture means a single identical display of relevant operational information shared by more than one command, which facilitates collaborative planning and assists all echelons to achieve situational awareness. And so the idea is, uh, and what they're working on in Australia is, that they have situational awareness by looking at the perspective of the past and then looking out into the future and using the past years, months, weeks, days as a guide to uh, flood forecasting, stream flow forecasting, seasonal flow forecasting and so on and to improve their situational awareness of just what is our condition right at this moment and what can we anticipate as we move forward. Uh, they have produced maps which are continually updated every day of the wetness of their country. And the blue area here means wetter than normal. The red area means drier than normal. And this map is updated every day um, as new computations are done. And we can be doing the same thing with the result of the national water model. One of the things that the group, the, the utilities in Australia are doing, and this is um, uh, Melbourne Water is an example of this for the water supply of the city of Melbourne, is they use this map of the relative water conditions Blue means wet, red means dry, as a way of anticipating how much runoff that they're going to get into their reservoir system if rainfall occurs. And so this is kind of an operational tool for water supply uh, assessment. Uh, one of my graduate students, Gonzalo Espinosa, has been doing similar kind of calculations using the National Land Data and Simulation System for the United States. So we are already here well set up that we could be doing the same kind of uh, modeling and anomaly assessment as the Australians are already doing. And so the question we'd like to deal with here is, can we develop common metrics at the continental scale between the United States and Australia so that we can say, oh, they're wet, we're dry, and even though we're using different models, we can make the same kinds of assessments. So let me conclude here by saying that uh, this is our draft research plan. I wouldn't say it's a final plan. It's certainly um, evolving, even in preparing for the seminar, we evolve uh, to some degree. Uh, we want very much to engage the, uh, the faculty advisors of student participants in the Summer Institute as the research plan evolves, so that um, the faculty advisors' ideas get incorporated into the plan as well, and not just the ones of the theme leaders and myself, as you've heard up to this point. Um, our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, not Wednesday of next week, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And there's going to be student lightning talks from the 2015 Summer Institute. Uh, this is going to be led by uh, Adnan Rajib and Priyarong Lin, who were, who were going to be the student coordinators this summer, and they participated last summer. Each of the student teams last summer did a lightning talk about their project, and some of those are going to present uh, next Tuesday. So thank you. That, uh, that concludes uh, our formal presentation. I'll turn it back to you, Emily. All right. Well, thank you, theme leaders, for your presentation. We have a few minutes left that we could try to take some questions and answers if everyone could stick around for a couple more minutes. I'm going to try to put the chat pod back at the bottom here. So bear with me one second. All right, so we had a, a little uh, technology glitch here where some of the sharing pods uh, moved around a little bit. But I've got a new chat pod up on the screen now. So if you're on the webinar and you have a question for some of the theme leaders or just a general question about the Summer Institute program um, in general, uh, you can go ahead and chat into the chat box at this time. Um, is, there, is everybody um, on speaker? 
Emily? I think that most people are not. Most people, are, it looks like I just connected through the computer audio, but I do not okay. have anyone muted. So if anyone uh, is connected through their phone and they would like to speak, um, you know, please feel free to do that as well. And while some typing is happening, I'm just going to uh, give a reminder that the, this talk was recorded, and we will post the recording to the Summer Institute website on the Quasi web page. I've just put that URL into the chat box. So this web page you know, is a good resource. It's got a lot of Summer Institute information on it. Um, the webinar schedule, the recorded webinars, as well as all the application information, and the Summer Institute program timeline. So if you have any questions, I would encourage you to check out this web page first, and then feel free to you know, reach out to me at Quasi um, or some of my Quasi colleagues. Uh, and this is the email address. And uh, like is, Park, is Ed Park on the phone? Can you speak, Ed? I see Ed's on the list there. I see that uh, Ed is on the list, uh, but he may be connected just through his speakers. I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Hey, oh, yeah, oh wonderful, Ed. Yeah. So just to introduce Ed is our uh, National Weather Service uh, lead for the National Flood Interoperability Experiment. So please, Ed, uh, could you provide any uh, comments and suggestions on the basis of what you heard? I think the, the theme leads did a fantastic job outlining both what their scientific interests were and how it relates to David, which you set forth as a charge for for this uh, this year's version of the of the experiment. I'll echo what you started off with that, with that this is an unprecedented time in the history of water resources, flood forecasting, and 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 national scale modeling for water. And so I, I hope we get a lot of great um, candidates uh, coming down and joining us at the National Water Center. I'm looking forward to it. Last year's experiment was really the highlight of my um, of, of, of my my year. Um, and I will say that within um, the federal government, within my agency, this has a very high uh, level of interest from the director of the National Weather Service, Dr. Uh, Louis Cellini, all the way up to. Um, the director of NOAA, Dr. Catherine Sullivan, and even the Department of Commerce is, is hyper-focused on what we're doing and what we're doing um, with students and within the research community. So I encourage you all to, to take advantage as best we can. And I'm, I'm just really enthusiastic to work with the STEAM leads, work with the students, and, and see where we end up uh, in a short six months from now um, with a better understanding of, of the potentially limitless um, tools and techniques we can apply towards these grand water resources challenges. And of course, I am absolutely indebted to Dr. Bateman for um, being the impetus for these, these engagements. Um, Ed, there's a question here from Courtney De Vittorio. Will wetlands be integrated into the model? And if so, how do you think the model will be adjusted to account for the hydrodynamics? I mean, can you give some thought to that? So right now, uh, the representation of wetlands is somewhat parameterized within the, net, the uh, land surface model. Um, the parameters on the NOAA MPP soil column are adjusted to reflect porosity. Uh, fluvial uh, pathways through, um, through those areas are complex, and it's not really well represented in the Fusinesque flow schema that's in the 250-meter in the, uh, routing grid. But over time, as we commit to um, this, this first version of the national model is just really a, an exercise of building up the framework. But as NOAA commits to our systems modeling uh, applications and approaches, we will augment various components of the model, whether it be natural processes in wetlands or reservoirs or diversions or enhanced snow uh, and data simulation techniques for snowpack. We'll exercise uh, the framework to get the best possible modeling representation um, um, into uh, into the national model. Are there any other comments that people are on the who are on the phone would like to make, or questions that you'd like to ask? I see John McHenry is there from the National Water Center. John, have you got any thoughts for Nando? Hello, David. I was excited to see John Nelson is going to be participating and exercising some of the hydrodynamic models that were mentioned. Uh-huh. 
Is, is Fernando there? Yeah, hi. <clears throat> hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Any thoughts, uh, Fernando? No, this stuff looks great. I mean, to build on what we did last summer, um, this is definitely uh, the areas that we want to focus on and that's going to help enhance um, the capabilities that we have. Um, just from my perspective of being involved last summer, I just thought this was a great opportunity to learn how our government responds to a lot of the water challenges um, across the country. And I don't think that opportunity really comes about too often. So not only do students get to learn about a lot of different models and modeling techniques and you know, earth system models, but also get to see how our government agencies um, address some of the big water issues across the country. Thanks. Uh, so Phyllis Fernando Salas, he now works at the National Water Center and he was a PhD student in our program here in Austin and one of the student coordinators for last year's Summer Institute. So thank you for all the work that you put into that, Fernando. We really appreciate it. Um, there's a question here from Chaz Jones. Are there opportunities for early career scientists, students, postdocs, early faculty to get involved with the Summer Water Institute if they're unable to attend? So our key idea, um, Chaz, is to engage students in the um, process. And so for early uh, career scientists or for, um, post, for postdocs, you can apply if you're within three years of your graduation by the time you make the application. So postdocs can attend in their own right. Um, and for the faculty side, we'd like student engagement to be the principal mechanism with the faculty um, engaged in advising their students. And we have provided this year for support for faculty to make one visit to the National Water Centre as part of um, their uh, support for the student that comes uh, to the centre. Now, broader than that, Ed, do you have any thoughts about um, how others might be engaged somehow? I mean, we haven't really discussed that too much or thought about it too much. Uh, no, I mean, we haven't really thought about that too much. I, I certainly encourage those that are interested to remain interested in Maybe, David, that's something we can talk about when we're down there in March, um, see if there's yeah. a way to have external uh, report outs or conversations. But I certainly we encourage more participation and dialogue um, always. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that's even you can feel it emerging as we've put this plan together is the degree of overlap there is between uh, separate themes and knowledge bases and so on that the different theme leaders represent. And certainly there are others outside that group that could potentially contribute. And we haven't really worked out the mechanism by which that could happen yet, but we've got plenty of time since the Summer Institute doesn't happen until June. So, And we've got a fairly comprehensive plan already together where we know what we're trying to do. And really the, the, the idea here is to build on the national water model. We're not trying to reinvent the national water model. We're just saying there is a national water model. And what will then be possible, which of course is this Flood inundation mapping, detailed hydraulics, and ensemble forecasting, and other things, the common operating picture. So we're, we're taking the existing national water model as sort of a presupposed um, point of departure. And we'd certainly, we want to welcome everybody to uh, participate in this exercise as much as possible, and the doors are wide open. Any other thoughts, or is Pierong Lin there? Can you speak, Pierong? I see your name's on the list. Maybe she's just listening at the, uh, um, so Pierong says she's, uh, she's just not on, the, she's not on the phone. Okay, that's fine. She, she'll be speaking next week. Uh, she'll be one of the two people leading the student uh, lightning talks. Um, any other comments that anybody else wants to make? Okay, well, Emily, I'll turn it back over to you then. Yeah, well, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Uh, the recording should be posted uh, later this afternoon if anyone would like to view the recording again. And as a reminder, Summer Institute applications are due by 11.59 p.m. on March 15, 2016. So if you are thinking about submitting an application, I encourage you to get that process started and reach out to us with any questions you may have. Uh, but I think that, you know, that wraps it up for today. So thank you, theme leaders, for participating in the webinar. It was very interesting, very informative, and it sounds like the Summer Institute is going to be a great program this year. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>